Well, you, you guys have been learning a lot about interparticle attractions. And let's see if we can apply a little bit of that to a real situation here. Um, I'll give you some information and ask you to make some predictions. So think about what you've been learning about inter interparticle forces. Um, what I have up here is two bottles with hexane in them. Hexane C6H14, a chain of six carbons. Carbon likes to form chains with uh, the hydrogens filling in all the spots. Well, can you tell me about the nature of the carbon-hydrogen bond? Close or far away in electronegativity? Close, they're really close in electronegativity. So that bond is, for all intents and purposes, nonpolar. Uh, so we're dealing with a basically uh, nonpolar covalent liquid. So what are the main interparticle forces, in this case intermolecular forces? Dispersion forces, right? Uh, and here I have some water, H2O. What are the main intermolecular forces, interparticle forces, in this case intermolecular forces? Hydrogen bonding. Which one would you expect to be strong? Hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds. Uh, no, these are big generalizations, but yeah, I would expect, uh, on, on the first approximation, I would expect uh, the water to have some stronger interparticle forces. In fact, immediately upon prepping this demo, I noticed I was confronted with the dealing with intermolecular forces. Because I said to myself, I don't want to pour hexane. Every time I've tried to pour hexane in front of a demo, in a demo situation, I've gotten it all over the place. It is a very unruly liquid. It goes everywhere, whereas water pours very neatly. Why might that be? Stronger forces in water, particularly what, what property are we talking about? Surface tension, right. Hexane just goes everywhere, which is not a good thing because it's, uh, it's carcinogenic. So <laughs> I poured it under the hood and I, I poured it from one thing into another very carefully and then got, got it into this bottle. You can see it's very unruly. Look at that. Water just settles right down. Okay, so we're going to pour uh, some water into the hexane. Now let's think about it. There are two, one or two things is going to happen in broad terms. Either the hexane and the water are going to be miscible, they'll dissolve in each other, like two, liqui with two liquids we call that miscible, or they won't. Well, if in order for them to be miscible, we would have to say that the Dipole, or, or that the uh, uh, dispersion forces, we would have to break the dispersion forces in the, in the hexane, break the hydrogen bonds in the water. What type of interaction would be forming between the hexane molecule and the water if it went into solution? <coughs> mm. Water has nothing to hydrogen bond with, but it's still polar, right? <coughs> Dipole. Induced dipole. Dipole induced dipole. Yeah, exactly. It should be able to induce dipole. Now, if that dipole induced dipole interaction is strong enough, it will go into solution. If it's not strong enough to balance out the breaking of the other forces, it won't. So let's give it a try. Water into hexane. What do you see? They're not mixing. The water is pouring through the hexane to the bottom, which tells me the water is denser. Water is pretty dense stuff. You might expect that. So now I've got, so apparently those uh, dipole induced dipole interactions are not strong enough to counter the uh, effect. Uh, or, or to counter the interactions, to break up the interactions of the dipole-dipole interactions in the water. Uh, particularly, we pro that's probably what's accounting for this. Now, re recall this is a gross gender. I mean, when we say something's insoluble, I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of hexane molecules made their way down there, but by and large, it's insoluble. In fact, I, let's take it this way. I wouldn't want to drink this water. So let's try it again. Let's, I, for my purposes, I want to do this with two bottles. So we should see the same thing. 
water pouring through the hexane to the bottom. And we get two layers. Can you see the layers there? See the interface between the layers? Now, let me call your attention to two solids here. I have two purple crystalline solids. One of them is iodine, I2. The other is potassium permanganate. Uh, what's holding the iodine crystals together? I2. Is the bond polar? No, two identical atoms can't be polar, so uh, no dipole. So what are we left with? Dispersion, which ought to be pretty sizable because iodine's got a lot of electrons in it, right? It's a pretty, pretty big atom. Um, and potassium permanganate, what's holding that? Ionic bond. You notice I have to be careful. I'm not going to say an intermolecular force. That would be inappropriate terminology for an ionic compound. The inner particle force, though, is the ionic bond between the potassium cations and the permanganate anions. Remember, the permanganate anions are held together by covalent bonds. Now, let's, which one do you want to do first? Iodine or permanganate? Iodine. Someone says iodine. Okay, I heard iodine first. So let's take a little bit of iodine. Take a little bit of a few crystals of iodine, drop them in there. Oh, hey, cool, some are floating on the interface. That's good. Cool. <laughs> and let's wait for that to. Dissolving, at least not dissolving very rapidly in the water. As a matter of fact, iodine does dissolve eh, okay in water, but not nearly as well as it does in hexane. So let's think about what's happening there. In order for it to dissolve in the hexane, what inner particle forces have to be broken? Dispersion forces between the iodine molecules and dispersion forces between the hexane molecules. What inner particle attraction is forming? What interaction is formal? <coughs> Dipole. Yeah, no dipoles in there. Still dispersion forces between the iodine and the hexane, right? So the dispersion, but thanks for taking a risk, that's good. <laughs> you're, you're, you're thinking. Uh, iodine and hexane, so that tells me the dispersion forces between the iodine and the hexane molecules are stronger than the dispersion forces between iodine and iodine, or hexane and hexane, or the sum of those together. Okay, so it goes into solution there. Now, for if it did go into solution in water, for it to go into solution in water, what would have to be what interparticle forces would have to be broken? Hydrogen bonds in water and dispersion forces in iodine. What interparticle force would form if iodine did dissolve in water, which it does a little bit. Somebody said it back there, I heard it. Uh, we got water, water, even though it has nothing to hydrogen bond to here, is a dipole. So dipole induced dipole. So the fact that it doesn't dissolve much in water tells me that the dipole induced dipole interactions are not strong enough to overcome the, uh, probably mainly the hydrogen bonding in the water. Water wants to hold on to itself too much to break up and let the iodine in, in other words. So, now, let's take a look at permanganate. Let's dissolve some potassium permanganate in water. Take a few crystals, or well, into our system here. Ah, that goes there. Right up over the top. Yeah, it's already dissolving in the water. Yeah, it's already dissolving in the water. 
Wow, it's got some plumes coming down from where it's on the interface. That's cool. Okay, let's take a look at what's going on. What interparticle forces, let's take a look at the water, which it did dissolve in. Remember water at the bottom layer, it's more dense. What interparticle forces had to be broken for, for, uh, for potassium for magnetic going to solution? Hydrogen bonding in the water and ionic bond in the potassium per manganate. What interparticle forces form? Ion dipole in both cases, and more than that, remember the oxygens on the permanganate can receive a hydrogen bond because they have lone pair of electrons on them. So uh, we're actually getting hydrogen bonding with the, with the permanganate ion. That's something you need to consider when something goes into solution. It can actually, something that doesn't have a hydrogen on it, even though it has an, if it has an oxygen or particularly nitrogen or oxygen on it, can receive a hydrogen bond. And so, the fact that it is going in solution in the water tells me that those ion dipole interactions and hydrogen bonding with the permanganate ion are strong enough to overcome the, the hydrogen bonding between the water and, uh, the and the ionic bonding within the potassium permanganate. Now, if it did go into solution in the hexane, what would have to be broken? Dispersion forces for the hexane, an ionic bond for the potassium permanganate. What would form? Ion-induced dipole, yeah, something like that. Yeah, okay. Which tells me that it's not, it does the, that force would not be strong enough to overcome the ionic bonding. Now, we have a rule of thumb that we use in chemistry, which is light dissolves light. Polar stuff tends to dissolve polar stuff in ionic compounds. And uh, nonpolar stuff tends to dissolve nonpolar stuff. There's a misconception that, that sometimes, somehow, polar stuff repels nonpolar stuff. That's not the case. Everything attracts everything. It's a matter of how much. Is the inner particle attractions between uh, what's forming strong enough to, that are forming strong enough to overcome the inner particle actions that you're breaking up? Uh, but it's still it's a good rule of thumb. I mean, you use it all the time in the lab. It's like, yeah, they get dissolved. That's polar, and that's nonpolar. You know. Um, so there you have it. Light dissolves light.